past 42 years, over 5,000 concerned people from across the globe have come together in Eugene, Oregon for the oldest and largest public interest environmental law conference in the world. This conference educates and inspires action on environmental and social justice goals. Here are some highlights of the 42nd Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Welcome, thank you for joining us for the Kicking Gas panel, the movement to transition off methane in the Pacific Northwest. As the title suggests, we are going to be discussing ways to decarbonize the gas sector, looking at utility commission, litigation, um, grassroots organizing strategies, and communication strategies. So um, we have an awesome group of panelists. I am going to let each panelist introduce themselves. And then we are going to save questions until the end to make sure that we have time to get through all of the material. I'm a senior attorney with uh, Earth Justice Base in Seattle. Uh, I'm so honored that you chose to uh, spend your time with us, and I'm, I'm so honored to share the, the uh, podium with this group of brilliant and fierce advocates. Um, I'm going to shake off the trauma of watching myself on that screen. <laughs> uh, I know that I don't sound that grating and look that old. Um, and i uh, going to talk. Um, about the, the challenge of getting gas out of, uh, out of our homes, our residential and commercial buildings. Uh, burning fossil methane, aka natural gas, is one of the largest sources of carbon emissions in the country. Uh, it's also the fastest growing, um, and it is the lowest cost and, frankly, easiest way to, to uh, reach our decarbonization goals. Uh, because of this wonderful technology, the, the heat, electric heat pump. Who has an electric heat pump in their home? Right. They're, they're awesome, right? They keep you warm, keep you cool, uh, incredibly efficient and, and non-polluting. Uh, and when we stop burning gas for heat, hot water, and cooking in our homes, there's all sorts of other benefits in terms of pollution, as we just heard about. Um, so the, the first step uh, in the transition is as, a, as the guy with the fantastic eyebrows said, uh, the, the first challenge is to stop digging the hole deeper. Uh, and, and so the focus for the last few years has been on when we build new buildings, we, we requ you know, require them to be built with electric uh, uh, heat, hot water, and, and cooking instead of, of gas. And that's where the, the challenge has been. By, by uh, 2021, Dozens uh, and dozens of jurisdictions around the country had adopted local ordinances like, like Berkeley and Eugene to require uh, uh, or, or either require or, or incentivize use of electric rather than fossil fuel uh, appliances in new buildings. Uh, and you could tell this is effective in this map. Um, uh, all these states in red had adopted statewide laws that prohibit uh, local communities from doing that. So the, the party of economic and personal liberty uh, uh, has a sort of different flavor when it comes to fossil fuels. Um, so as we as we heard in the in the uh, film, City of Berkeley was one of the, one of the first, if not the first. Very simple and, and elegant uh, a statute. It banned um, essentially banned fossil fuel piping into new buildings. You can have whatever appliance you want, but you can't have a fossil fuel pipe. Uh, or a, a gas pipe. Um, uh, the first uh, 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 community here in Oregon, of course, whoops, was uh, Eugene. Um, I think we have an elected official from Eugene here. Uh, <laughs> thanks to your leadership and the great work of uh, the community and grassroots, Eugene adopted this, this wonderful ordinance to uh, phase out uh, uh, fossil fuel infrastructure in, in um, new new buildings, and you know, these things don't happen in in, in a vacuum. It, it requires you know a ton of organizing and community work, uh, led by people like Aya, 
Uh, so, you know, if you're from Eugene, you have so much to be proud of uh, in this. And, and yeah, as, as I said in the movie, this, this is a big deal. This is existential for the gas companies. And they put millions of dollars into this referendum, and we're going to you know, politicize this issue of they're taking away your gas stoves and, and so on. So uh, into this you know, largely political fight over local ordinances um, came this surprising decision in, in this uh, case. And this is where we get the CLE credits. We'll talk about a little bit of law. <laughs> um, the, the California Restaurant Association, which was bankrolled by the California gas utilities, uh, they paid all the legal fees for this, brought this sort of novel legal claim that local regulation uh, at this building level is preempted by federal law, federal law called EPCA, Energy Policy and Conservation Act. What is EPCA? EPCA is a, a, a federal law that does a number of things. One of the things it does is set uh, directs the Department of Energy to set nationwide appliance efficiency standards. So there's one standard for like the energy efficiency of a refrigerator or a furnace or, or whatever, right? And so one of the things the law does is say, okay, once the federal government sets this national efficiency standard, states can't set their own standards. And if, you know, that makes a certain amount of sense if you make refrigerators uh, you don't want an Oklahoma standard and Arkansas standard. So there's a national standard. Well, um, these guys said that just by limiting the use of uh, gas appliances in buildings, you have run afoul of this uh, federal preemption standard. And, you know, honestly, when this, when this started, I was like, this isn't really a serious claim. And they lost at the district court, and they, just, like, they dismissed the case at, a, at an early stage. Um, but... Um, they appealed to the Ninth Circuit. They drew three uh, Republican-appointed judges, including two judges appointed by you-know-who. Mm -hmm. um, and the majority opinion said that, uh, yeah, EPCA doesn't just preempt local appliance efficiency standards. It, it preempts, it, or it cuts off any regulation that implicates the use of a regulated appliance. So it, it transformed a, a limit on local efficiency standards into a, essentially a right to use any regulated appliance. And if you sort of think about the logic of that, it, it gets in the way of any number of like basic police power functions of the state. Like you can't, you can't prohibit a, a gas burning a furnace in the neonatal you know, ICU or you, know, you can't regulate dorm fridges. I mean, it's crazy, the, the, the scope of this ruling. Um, so the fallout was that it created significant uncertainty for communities like Eugene and others around the country that adopted these ordinances. They were at uh, risk of, uh, uh, you know, getting sued themselves. Uh, there, uh, there was very vigorous petition for rehearing on Bonk to the Ninth Circuit, joined by the Department of Energy, which implements um, uh, APCA. And also, said the Ninth Circuit has completely gone off the rails here. Rehearings on Bonk are very hard to get. Uh, it wasn't successful. Uh, but the the opinion was amended, and it was just so ridiculous for, for you lawyers. They just went in and they 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 just s inserted the word narrow in like seven places, <laughs> and like there's nothing narrow about the ruling. And like if you just say it's narrow and don't change the logic, I, I don't know what it does. But so um, what's left? Are, are local communities hamstrung in the wake of of Berkeley? No, not at all. Is is the message? There's a lot of options. I'm going to buzz through these really quickly. EPCA itself contains an exemption from its preemption provisions for building codes. Uh, as long as you don't ban specific appliances, you can set performance standards, efficiency performance standards that effectively make it pretty difficult to use gas uh, appliances. And that's just because heat pumps are so much more efficient uh, than, than gas. We already have an example of this. The state of Washington has adopted statewide building code that doesn't prohibit gas. Um, but it really makes it pretty hard. Uh, you know, you have to have like really thick walls and really intense windows and stuff if you're so keen to have a gas uh, furnace. Um, why can't I hit one button? Uh, Kara's going to talk about utility side regulation. The Ninth Circuit was very clear that that remains open. States have a lot of authority over regulating the provision of gas. Uh, Berkeley, the Berkeley decision was just talking about once the gas shows up at your doorstep. Uh, a third post-Berkeley option 
is the regulation of air emissions. Why isn't this preempted? Well, because the Clean Air Act gives local communities uh, and states a decent amount of authority to regulate air quality. So you don't regulate appliances, you regulate air quality. Uh, and we've, we've seen this, the city of Seattle adopted a performance standard uh, for air quality that gets at existing buildings, not just new buildings. And then the last um, option is uh, there's also uh, uh, authority under the Clean Air Act to regulate uh, appliances. So uh, Berkeley, or not Berkeley, Bay Area Air Quality Management District has already done this. California is looking at it statewide, is to set air pollution standards for appliances. Um, again, you use, you know, use whatever fuel you want, but it's got to meet an air quality standard, and, and you know, fossil fuels really can't meet that standard under current technology. So I think the takeaway um, that I, I really want people to get is Berkeley was a speed bump. It's, you know, the, the option of just banning gas is not really available in the Ninth Circuit. Um, and I'll, I'll note that, you know, the Ninth Circuit covers a, a number of Western states. New York has passed a Berkeley-style ordinance. It has been challenged uh, in federal court under the same theory. Um, if you are someone that worries about circuit splits and the Supreme Court getting their hands on this, um, that's a good thing to worry about. <laughs> um, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna skip this for a second and just uh, I'm, I'm almost out of time. Uh, shift gears a little a, a little bit. So the states of uh, all the West Coast states have adopted aggressive greenhouse gas targets. Have a number of policies in place to phase out fossil gas. And in light of that, it seems like a weird time to be expanding uh, the provision of of methane gas to these states, but that is exactly what is happening. The GTN pipeline, which uh, um, you see the map here, which is for California, Oregon, and Washington, uh, was recently approved by FERC to uh, significantly expand capacity. Uh, there is a whole panel on this you should check out tomorrow. Um, we are suing FERC alongside the states of Washington and Oregon on a really crucial legal principle, which is, you know, doesn't FERC have to consider the fact that these states are working hard to phase out fossil gas when they approve uh, uh, expansion of gas, which is not something that they were willing to consider. So uh, in closing, I'll turn it over to, to my colleagues here. I am, I am absolutely convinced that uh, a generation from now, people will look at us in, in awe and wonder that the way that we heat our homes is to dig up Jurassic era uh, rotting ferns and dinosaurs and pipe them into our homes and burn it. Like, it's really stupid. It blows up. It's bad for your health. It's incredibly inefficient. And we have these wonderful alternatives. So we are going to make this transition. It is happening. Uh, but we need all of you to help in, in whatever way it is you can to talk to your local uh, builders, utilities, uh, governments to help us uh, uh, land that uh, land that plane. So thank you so much for your uh, your attention, and I'll turn it over to Kara. I'm going to talk about the Public Utility Commission, and do not go to sleep, folks. <laughs> this is important, right? This is important, and I actually woke up this morning really excited to talk about it. So my name. <laughs> Dylan, this is for you. My name is Kara Saylor. I'm the director and one of two staff attorneys, nearly three staff attorneys, at the Green Energy Institute. So for those of you who don't know us, uh, GEI is a climate policy and energy law organization. We're housed in Lewis and Clark Law Schools, Environmental, Natural Resources, and Energy Law Program. And um, we focus on developing smart and comprehensive strategies to support a swift and equitable transition to a carbon-free energy grid. So that's a little bit about us and where we come from. I threw out this, I'm going to call what we're talking about natural gas. I just, that is what the law talks about it, that's just in my head. So just so you know, I'm going to call it natural gas or gas, it's the same thing. Um, so, as a climate policy and energy law organization, GEI has been deeply involved um, in DOCUS, which are the official, that's the official name that the Public Utility Commission uses to describe the different matters that they handle. Um, and just in the last two years, we have been engaged in examining the costs and technology associated with decarbonizing natural gas and evaluated natural gas utility rates and planning. 
So what does a public utility commission do? It's an economic regulator. So that doesn't sound very sexy, right? We're not talking about health. We're not talking about safety necessarily. We're not talking about climate directly. But the challenge is all of those things are directly related to what it is that the Public Utility Commission is looking at. You just have to use the language that they understand, right? And, and that falls within their authority so they know that they have the authority to act. Um, you can see here that I've just flagged the two different um, Pacific Northwest um, Oregon, so the Oregon Public Utility Commission on the one, and then the Washington UTC, which is the Utilities Transportation Commission. Um, and you can see the different uh, uh, mandates that each have and, and be thinking about how do we get those things we care about, health, safety, climate, into there, into the mandate, right? Ensure safe, reliable, and quality utility services evaluate utility costs, risks, and performance to ensure just and reasonable rates. And then more recently, the PUC has, is also obliged to consider the impacts of their decision making on utility customers, um, and importantly, those in traditionally underserved communities. Now, I thought Washington UTC's language was really interesting on their website. They um, have a mandate to be a pro-equity, anti-racist government organization. I don't know that I've ever seen that on any agency's website. That is pretty cool. Um, they also similarly have to um, ensure safe, reliable, equitable, equitable, that's in their mandate, that's different from Oregon PUCs, and fairly priced service. Um, so, so, you know, what, is this, what does this matter? Like I said, I've been thinking a lot about how to get you all excited about the opportunities at the PUC. Um, and if you, if you, as I'm talking through some of the dockets that we've been engaged in, you might be thinking, gosh, that just feels like nibbling around the edges. Um, but I think that there are two reasons why this work matters. Um, the first is that it's a rare obligation of a state agency to think about and plan for the future. And the PUC is, is the, the only state agency really whose actions impact the future. Hmm. Um, I mean, other agencies evaluate, like the Oregon Department of Energy will be sort of setting the strategy for Oregon, but, but this agency, its mandate is to look at what the utility is doing now and up to 20 years into the future. Um, it also, at the heart of, so I would say that, you know, as part of that, it has to grapple with the economic impact of gas expansion, and therefore, sort of by proxy, the economic impact of climate change um, and at the heart of its obligation, it has a duty to protect customers. Um, and second, as you'll see, uh, as I talk through some of the, the slides, the processes that I described, they appear opaque, and I think they are initially. But I will say that the Public Utility Commission is very accessible um, and willing to, uh, the staff are incredibly available and willing to walk folks through the process. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is that regular citizens the folks in this room have the opportunity to ask questions directly of the utility. Uh, so you don't always have that opportunity, right, with polluters in the air quality permit context. You don't have the opportunity to approach them directly, and they and those those processes are are involved then in the at the end of the day what the agency does with the information. Okay, so I'm going to set the stage here a little bit. We have three gas-only utilities in Oregon. 48% of households use gas. Northwest Natural is by far the largest gas utility in Oregon. It serves the largest population centers, including Portland. Just as a reminder, many of the folks in the room may know this, but just in case not, beginning in 2022, gas utilities were required to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions pursuant to the cap and reduce program that the Oregon's Environmental Quality Commission adopted. That's called the Climate Protection Program. We also call it a cap and reduce. Um, that prompted our public, Oregon's Public Utility Commission to initiate an investigation. This is also kind of cool that the agency could do this. As to how the program might impact gas utility planning and rate making. And through that process with the incredible ad advocacy of dozens of organizations, the PUC took a really hard look at what decarbonization of our gas utilities will really require and recommended some changes to utility planning as well as rate making.
but rather than open a larger docket um, about how best to do that, the commissioners decided to implement each of those uh, sort of decisions in each of the dockets as they came up. So it's been sort of an iterative, iterative process over the course of the years. But as many of you know, the Oregon Court of Appeals just this year, January 2nd, or I think I came into work and there it was, beginning of the year, invalidated the, the CPP um, on the basis of a technical notice flaw. So importantly, the courts really did not touch on the Environmental Quality Commission's authority to adopt and implement the CPP. And in fact, um, you know, Governor Brown's executive order, which, which prompted the CPP's uh, regulations for being enacted, that executive order still exists, and it directs um, DEQ and the EQC to cap and reduce greenhouse gas emissions from all liquid and gaseous fuels, including natural gas, consistent with the emissions reductions um, directions that are set out in the order. So that is sort of the underlying basis, legal requirement. Um, but, you know, does that change what the Public Utility Commission does? What do we have left? We have something called integrated resource plans. So this is this what, what I was telling you about the PUC um, being able to do this forward-looking planning. And this is how they do it. You can see the three of them here. Um, this is a roadmap for providing reliable and least cost, least risk service to the utilities customers consistent with state and federal energy policies. And this is important while addressing and planning for uncertainty. Um, so Oregon has had what was initially termed least cost planning since 1989. Uh, and least cost planning came about because of something that's known as, whoops, uh, it was the Washington Public Power Supply System, which overbuilt to meet what ended up being an inaccurate electricity forecast. So Whoops was responsible for the development of four nuclear power plants and one of the largest bond defaults in US history. The commission, um, after that happened, said it derived its authority to begin this least cost planning um, from its authority to protect customers and the public from unjust exactions and practices and to obtain adequate service at fair and reasonable rates. So you think about what the Public Utility Commission, the authority it has there. So two lessons from this history. The commission has, at least since 1989, addressed uncertainty. We are absolutely in a place of uncertainty right now, right? And in the absence of the CPP, it will continue to do that. It will continue to evaluate the uncertainty that the gas utilities face. The second, the commission has vast authority to initiate investigations to help utilities, stakeholders, and staff um, figure out uh, and, and educate themselves about the risks of gas expansions. Okay, but why, why participate in an IRP um, in particular? One reason is that as the PUC flows through the guidelines that's required to follow, at the end of the day it is approving the utilities plan and that puts into motion actions that are tricky to undo. So if the PUC says, yeah, it looks reasonable to spend millions of dollars on that capital investment, to help pump more gas into that section of the city that seems to have a pressure problem, the utility will build that investment and then point to that PUC's determination of acknowledgement, thumbs up, to say we should get rate recovery. Um, so you have to get in the process before it moves too far. Um, and another reason is that stakeholders can have a meaningful role in the outcome. So who participates in what they do? Uh, what do they do? You can see some of the participants that we often see in plannings. We see Oregon Department of Energy, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality, of course the staff at the commission, which are phenomenal. Emma. Okay. And then Energy Trust of Oregon, AWEC represents industrial consumers, and then CUB, the Citizens Utility Board. We should all support CUB, donate to them. They do amazing work, but they need our help. They need advocates. Um, so we attend workshops, we ask a lot of questions, we suggest changes, we offer resources, we prepare comments, and then we actually intervene in the docket once the, the filing is made by the utility. 
And um, we have prioritized, and I'll just track a little bit of what we've done. We've prioritized the involvement of new GEI, has uh, prioritized the involvement of new and different stakeholders, um, many of whom are unfamiliar with the process, but we can kind of hold their hands and walk them through the process. Staff and interveners, they um, identify questions they have for the company and then hold, they hold a workshop and the company is there in front of the commission and they have to answer questions from the commission. And they're often hard questions about whether they've done the proper planning, um, whether they've done the proper modeling and whether they have the proper investments planned. Um, so just to flag again the importance of this process because, oh, because it, it'll be back in a minute. Okay. Oh, thank you. I don't. I mean, yeah. You don't need it anyway. There's too many words. But um, because uh, once this is this plan is acknowledged, it makes it harder to show that the investment was imprudent when you get to the rate case. So what did we see? And I, I had the slides show sort of what each of the plans have: um, Northwest Natural, Cascade, Avista. We saw a lot of alternative fuels. We saw biogas, hydrogen, synthetic methane. Um, with, all th with respect to all three of those alternative fuels, there was an underrepresentation of costs and an overrepresentation of availability. I will say that um, some of the language from the commission was really excellent. Are the slides going to be available after? Uh, yeah, we can. We can make the slides available because yeah. there are some really great um, language from the commission about the importance of this planning process and why the commission is so important to evaluating how we move forward. So I'll just read one and then I'll be done. Oh, okay. 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 Because I'm out of time. Yeah. yeah, I'm out of time. So just this one: the results of such an IRP may raise new questions about the business and the regulatory model. But that transparent evaluation is necessary for the PUC and the stakeholder community to engage with urgency and creative thinking about implications and corresponding regulatory changes to ensure that a financial healthy utility is capable of providing safe and reliable gas service. Right? So it's just they're really grappling with this question of how do we gonna have people on the system for a while? We have to make sure that they have safe and reliable gas, but at the same time there are these existential questions about growing the system. Okay, oh wait, one more, really important. Why do we participate? Because we get to find out stuff like this. <laughs> and I'm gonna pass it, this is the very newly filed Northwest National Rate Case, they're planning to invest money into promoting their product to specific categories of people. Uh, go ahead. Just real quick show of hands, uh, how many people have heard the phrase or even said the phrase, now we're cooking with gas? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of just embedded itself in our culture a little bit. And uh, that's a little bit of why the Gas Leaks Project, my name's Caleb Herringa, I'm the Program Director for the Gas Leaks Project, uh, why we launched a couple years ago, is to really uh, kind of change the narrative amongst the public on uh, these issues around gas and the climate, health, and safety harms. Uh, we've been doing a variety of paid campaigns to sort of directly take it to the public and, and, and change the perception there. We've also been trying to hold the industry accountable a little bit for the way it misleadingly markets gas. Um, the, uh, you know, as you see here, uh, this is, these are two different um, advertisements from uh, Partnership for Energy Progress, which is the um, sort of front group that was formed by uh, a coalition of gas utilities in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah, they've been very active in both Washington and Oregon. Um, and you see with these, um, you know, the word clean is, is very prominent in almost all the advertising the industry uses. And uh, there's a reason for that. They, uh, they've been leaning really heavily into natural and clean and all those kind of things um, for decades, um, you know, since the 1930s or 40s when now we're cooking with gas was uh, cooked up in a PR firm somewhere and brought to the Bob Hope show and you know embedded into a whole bunch of culture and um, they haven't been stopping uh, you know th there's continual um, advertising to the public um, oftentimes that is you know in one way or another paid for by gas customers in some ways um, you know the, the none of those uh, the the industry likes to make a distinction between customer money and shareholder money uh, the shareholders would not have any money if it wasn't for customers. So, uh, uh, this is happening pretty, 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 pretty regularly everywhere, and so um, we've been trying really hard to 
called out where it happens. Uh, we petitioned the Federal Trade Commission, which right now is looking at updating their green guides, which provide uh, guidance to companies about how they can market their, their products, the sustainability of their products. Uh, we have uh, pushed really hard and we pushed in Seattle and you know the garbage trucks in Seattle had some advertisements talking about how they run on renewable natural gas and uh, when he actually broke it down and looked at it, it was like a little sliver of renewable natural gas and the rest of it was conventional methane. And so uh, thanks to pressure there from local advocates, we uh, they've had to change their advertising on that. and. Um, do think it's really important that that um, that we be clear about about what methane is and, and the harms of it. So um, something to keep an eye out. And um, you know, because of all these decades of, of misleading advertising, uh, we see pretty clearly when you poll the public uh, that people tend to actually have a favorable opinion of natural gas. They tend to think it's clean. Uh, because they've been told that this has always been pitched as like the diet fossil fuel on some level like better than coal or better than oil and um, Of course when you actually add up all the methane pollution from the system uh, From the fracking from the pipelines from storage facilities uh, There's a lot of evidence that it's just as bad as coal or even worse in some cases especially when you're um, exporting it as we've all heard about here recently so um and this is pretty consistent, you know, when you when you talk about, you know, do you like natural gas? It's generally, yeah, that's great. And then you ask people, do you like methane gas? And you know, there's a huge, uh, huge public education that needs to happen because much of the public hasn't even heard of methane. So um, it's important. That's why it's very vital to sort of uh, re-examine what we're calling this and, and 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 how it's being presented to the public. Um, some of this was covered in the in the in the film uh, that we started with, and I'll I'll be concise too because we're we'll be restating. Don't want to restate too much, and want to leave time for Q and A. But um, you know, in addition to just general advertising, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that the industry is doing to uh, to really mislead the public on these things, mislead regulators on these things. Uh, we mentioned the uh, kids' activity books that um, Northwest Natural and other utilities were distributing in in schools. Um, the Northwest Natural, in particular, has uh, you know hired uh, scientists or experts that even had direct connections to the tobacco industry to um, sort of uh, you know muddy the waters when it comes to the science on on the harms of gas stoves. Um, you know we have a list on our website. There are 50 studies dating back to the 1970s talking that find you know a very real harms from gas cooking compared to electric cooking in the home. Um, so. Uh, there's not, it's not really a matter of debate, as no matter what they want to say. Um, and we mentioned the front groups, Eugene Residents for Energy Choice in the film, um, Partners, Partnership for Energy Progress, those continue to do a, a lot of work in the, in, in the public. Um, and the other thing, most recently, as I was putting this together, I'd totally forgotten about it, but just a couple months ago, The Guardian reported that Northwest Natural was literally offering incentives to builders to include gas appliances in homes, um, you know, literally direct payments to, to, to do it. And um, so there's just a sense of what the, uh, what the stakes are for the industry and um, kind of why it's very important as we talk to the public, as we talk to our friends and colleagues that are, are doing this work, um, that we use the right terms and, um, and um, you know, call out the industry when they're, when they're being misleading about this. Um, so I'll kick, it, I'll kick it to the next speaker here a little bit, but just, um, you know, Gas Leaks has a couple really exciting ad campaigns uh, launching actually on Monday. Uh, one of them is called uh, Hot and Toxic, and it's a parody of a reality show in which a woman is stuck in a home with toxic roommates, and <laughs> each of the toxic roommates represents a different toxin found in natural gas. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. It's going to be going around uh, listservs and such, and uh, we're really excited to uh, do some fun stuff there. The other thing I'll mention is that we're really interested in holding the American Gas Association accountable for um, all of the misinformation they've been peddling on that, and there's going to be opportunities to engage in that as well. So that's about it, and I'll leave some time here. Good morning, everyone, uh, and a special welcome to any gas industry representatives in the audience. Um, my name is Danny Noonan. I'm a, a climate and energy strategist at Breach Collective. Don't let my tidiness and disheveled <laughs> appearance fool you. I'm actually highly educated and experienced. Um, in fact, I have a, a law degree from an Australian law school, um, and I mentioned that as a disclaimer. I'm not a US attorney. I'm not barred in 
Oregon or any other US state, so I'm not holding myself out as an attorney and nothing I say should be construed or relied upon as legal advice. I need to say that for many reasons. Um, all right, so building on what Kara said about um, gas utility accountability through the PUC and some of what uh, Caleb just said about uh, misinformation that the gas utilities um, and trade groups are entering in into, um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about potential legal mechanisms for accountability outside of the Public Utilities Commission um, and focusing, uh, focusing specifically on uh, gas utilities misrepresentation uh, around the air quality effects and impacts of, of using gas appliances. Um, and so I guess like the context for this is that um, late last year we, we a coalition of groups submitted a letter to the Oregon Attorney General asking them to investigate Northwest Natural's air quality claims under Oregon's Unlawful Trade Practices Act, um, which I'm going to refer to as the UTPA. So this presentation for the sort of 10 minutes or so I had, I had a lot of slides um, shared for CLE purposes, but I'm going to try and sort of race through a lot of this content because it's, it's a little bit wonky and technical, um, a lot of issues of statutory interpretation. Um, but I'm going to talk about the UTPA, I'm going to talk about Washington's Equivalent Act, which is the uh, Consumer Protection Act, um, and then I'm also going to talk about some of the types of claims that gas utilities are do making that I think could, you know, fall within the jurisdiction of this Act. Um, so, with that being said, the UTPA is uh, Oregon's main consumer protection statute, and it protects consumers from a sort of broad swathe of, of conduct. Um, and it also gives, um, it gives both private litigants, so individuals or, or you know, organizations, as well as the Attorney General um, the ability to bring a suit. But the Attorney General has much greater uh, investigatory and enforcement powers under the UTPAs and um, don't have to, to prove all the elements that, that private litigants do, particularly, you know, um, Article 3 standing purposes. Um, and so I, I included this case on the slide. I, I'm not going to go into it. I just include it to note that Oregon courts have interpreted the UTPA so that it applies not just to sort of affirmative falsehoods, you know, incorrect statements, but also withholding factual information in a misleading way. And I think I'll talk about why I think that's particularly relevant to what gas utilities are doing in a moment. Um, the main case I'm going to talk about very briefly is the Living Essentials decision. Um, this case was instituted by um, Attorney General Rosenblum uh, against the manufacturers of Five Hour Energy. I think we have all are all familiar with Five Hour Energy, little, little packets of, yeah, um, of caffeine, <laughs> essentially. Um, and, and the case was brought actually about the non-caffeine ingredients and some of the claims uh, that, that the manufacturers of Five Hour Energy were making, as well as some claims they were making that suggested that doctors like overwhelmingly approve of using five hour energy. Which, yeah. Anyway, the, the case was dismissed by the trial court um, because they read into the, the Unlawful Trade Practices Act a requirement that, um, that rep representations be material to consumer purchasing decisions, that you can sort of demonstrate that this would influence whether or not someone bought five hour energy. Um, and they found that the particular claims that were being um, prosecuted were not, um, w they found that they weren't material. Um, the Oregon Court of Appeals agreed on this point and then the state further appealed this to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court sided with the state and disagreed with the lower courts and found that um, the uh, Text, context, and legislative history demonstrate that the statute unambiguously does not require proof that a defendant's conduct was material to purchasing decisions. In other words, misleading conduct per se that it is, is actionable under the UTPA. So you don't have to demonstrate that, oh, someone would have not purchased this thing or have not you know, taken the service had they not been misled. Thank you. Um, and the, the court also found that the absence of reading this requirement in essentially didn't have, at least on its face, free speech implications. And we can talk a little bit about sort of potential as applied implications as well. Um, so that's Oregon's uh, Consumer Protection Act, the UTPA. Washington's, I'm going to touch on very briefly. This isn't even sort of 
broader statute is written and many of the terms are not defined in the way they are in Oregon, so it's been up to uh, courts to interpret those and the broader packet of slides I included for CLE purposes includes a couple cases sort of interpreting those terms. However, unfortunately, the statute also has a section that um, excludes from its jurisdiction actions that are regulated by the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission. Um, you know, my background in the legal world is in plaintiff litigation, and I look at a, a language like that and I'm like, we can get around it, we can, you know, we can make the argument. <laughs> and, you know, if, if we're talking about sort of an attorney general investigation, there's probably a question whether like, at a sort of pre-litigation stage before a law lawsuit's actually filed, whether a gas utility would try to say, you're trying to correct our misinformation, but you have no jurisdiction here, so we're not even going to respond, you know. That would be an interesting PR move by a utility, I think. Um, but I think there's at least a question that the Washington statute in particular um, disclaims or, or, or excludes utilities from its jurisdiction. Um, and this just brings me to some more general considerations when we're talking about potential lawsuits is, you know, whether a state or private action would be the way to go. Um, which kinds of misrepresentations would be most actionable? So we've seen um, uh, claims being made, uh, as Caleb mentioned, by, you know, truck, uh, the uh, waste disposal services using just a, a tiny portion of renewable natural gas and saying that their things are running on renewable natural gas. Unfortunately, some of the broader claims that utilities are making around renewable natural gas at the moment get at these like sort of technical definitions of what is RNG and renewable thermal credits and things like that. And it's, it's been a, a subject to some extent of, of uh, PUC proceedings, but that can kind of get the sort of the fuzzier it gets and the more that the utilities I think can be technically correct, the harder I think it would be to bring an action. And then the question here about like what kinds of representations are we talking about because as we know gas utilities also engage in regulatory processes and they lobby at the legislature and they engage in a lot of political speech which has a higher level of protection arguably than than you know commercial speech about their products and services um, so this is uh, just to sort of close the door on the jurisdictional question this is the PUC's enabling statute and it does talk about the PUC having jurisdiction um, in all controversies respecting rates, valuation services, and all matters of which the Commission has jurisdiction. So I think there's also a question in Oregon as to whether that gives the PUC exclusive jurisdiction over gas utilities or whether, you know, that's it's sort of a concurrent thing where, you know, the, the PUC regulates particularly the ability for, for utilities to set rates and recover cover costs, but we still also have this consumer statute for um, just general commercial conduct of utilities. And I should also note that Northwest Natural is not, as a corporation, is not just a utility. They have a number of businesses, including um, they sell appliances and an appliance center. So, you know, I think, and then this case I've, I've included here um, was from uh, Washington DC, so not Washington State. And that was a, um, a, an action brought under the consumer protection statute there. Um, which was dismissed um, because it was found that the, that consumer protection statute in, in the District of Columbia uh, also um, excluded gas utilities. So Oregon, I think, is in a pretty good shape in terms of the statute, but we are seeing some of the early cases being brought against gas utilities for misinformation being dismissed on those grounds. That was the law. I'm just going to talk about the facts really quickly. So um, this is an example of conduct I think would be actionable. Um, this is from Northwest Natural's website in 2021. And the main point here is there's actually significant qualitative and quantitative differences between um, electric and gas cooktops and how they're used and the types of pollutants they produce. In particular, you know, electric uh, cooktops do not pollute, uh, produce nitrogen oxides. And yet this air quality information is suggesting that they're, you know, com comparable or ident if not identical. Northwest Natural recently updated their um, copy. I wonder why. Um, and, but I still think this makes that sort of fundamental error. Whether you're using a gas or electric cook cooktop, and especially when, et cetera, at high temperatures, use ventilation. Yes, but there's still differences between 
the pollutants produced by those types of cooktops and also the effect that ventilation has on them. There is some evidence showing that ventilation is not very effective at removing nitrogen oxides from the home, at least, you know, your standard range hood. Um, Northwest Natural has been sponsoring this page so that it appears at the top of searches in Eugene for things like gas stoves, air quality. Um, and this page stands in sort of pretty stark contrast to what they say about carbon monoxide, which is saying, which is acknowledging that there is a risk here. Whereas you, you search NOx or nitrogen oxides on Northwest Natural's website, you will not find a single result. Um, they also engage in misinformation here for some reason in saying that get natural gas is non-toxic and only produces heat, carbon dioxide and water vapour. We know there's dozens of co-pollutants that exist with utility grade uh, methane gas. Um, just so everyone knows, I'm not just picking on Northwest Natural, Cascade Natural Gas, a utility that also has a service territory in Oregon, also engages in misinformation and science denial on their website. Um, and I'm I've run way over time, I've run way over time, but recommend, uh, I included these slides just to show that um, Northwest Natural's misrepresentations in political fora are arguably even more egregious than what they're putting just to, to customers in, in bills and, and on their website. Um, the evidence is improving all the time and, you know, thinking about causation in a litigation context, we're starting to be able to attribute um, the level of uh, asthma that is, you know, uh, caused by gas stoves in different states. And there's also this really growing body of documentary evidence, um, as Caleb mentioned, going back to the 50s, if not earlier, of gas utilities and trade groups being aware of these risks and engaging in an explicitly tobacco industry style campaign to suppress that information. And so I recommend checking out that report as well. Um, this was a bunch of other claims that I'm not going to get into, but I think there's actually quite a few, few potential causes of action for this type of conduct. If anyone has the stones to do it. Anyway. <laughs> awesome. And I do want to just point out, we, do, we can share these slides with folks. My email will be at the end. I think it may be the easiest if, if folks just shoot me an email. I can share it, um, all of these slides with, with everyone. So hi folks, my name is Aya Cockrum. I am the coalition coordinator for Fossil Free Eugene and we're gonna do a little bit of a pivot in this presentation and talk about how we can kick gas from the grassroots. Um, I've been working on this campaign for about two years now. Um, so starting off to tell you a little bit about Fossil Free Eugene. So, we are a coalition of grassroots organizations calling on the city of Eugene to follow through with the goals that it set through it for itself through, um, through its own uh, climate, climate recovery ordinance and lead the way to forging a just transition off of fossil fuels for all of its residents. Our coalition has about 15 active members with some of our core uh, founding members um, highlighted in this picture here. Um, and our local gas utility, as you may have figured out through the other presentations, is Northwest Natural, um, who has stood in opposition of our campaign um, at all levels, as, and as that documentary illustrated for you all. So we have a three-fold platform. The first item is to support policy to mandate that construction in Eugene be built all electric. We've been putting a lot of energy there. Um, but we also are working to facilitate a just transition for frontline and historically marginalized communities and working with local utilities to transition our grid to 100% renewable energy by 2030. In Eugene, we're incredibly fortunate because the Eugene Water and Electric Board is already at about 90% renewable energy, so closing that gap is a lot easier and it you know, makes a really big difference when we are transitioning <coughs> to all electric that we have that really clean grid. So I wanted to dig in really quickly to that second platform item and talk about that the just transition uh, piece. So this is really important in our campaign because when we look at the economic impacts of gas, the climate impacts of gas, and the health <coughs> impacts of gas, uh, which we could talk about all day, that could be an entirely different panel, but when we look at all of these categories, we see that historically marginalized and frontline communities are disproportionately impacted every single time. 
And so, and these communities have also been historically underrepresented um, when in climate policy. And so it is incredibly central that we s center these communities as we work to transition to clean renewable energy and making sure that these communities are first, not last in this transition because of those disproportionate impacts. So we try and do this um, through providing trainings, resources to increase accessibility to the Inflation Reduction Act and other state, local, and national subsidies, also giving, giving tools to help folks who have gas in the home uh, who can't make that transition yet, but just to protect themselves health-wise. Um, we work with utilities and specifically the Eugene Water and Electric Board and hopefully others to uh, reduce energy burden for folks. And we also are <coughs> working to identify additional funding streams to support whole home retrofits, wanting to create some kind of justice fund to really help facilitate that transition. We, the coalition uses a number of tactics and I think one of the things that makes Fossil Free Eugene a really strong grassroots group is that we not only show that there is public support for this transition to clean energy, but also just really illustrate and drive home the breadth um, and the widespread impact that this has on our community. Um, so I, whenever I'm talking about fossil free Eugene tactics, coalition building is always at the top of the list. We not only have folks who are focused on climate, but we also have housing advocates, justice advocates. We work with architects and engineers and amazing lawyers and communications professionals. Every single person on this panel has been active in our campaign. And so we really are able to, I think, come at this from all angles, which is really powerful. Public testimony is a really important strategy that we use specifically. Uh, we've, we've shown up at Eugene City Council quite a bit, as Councilor Leach can probably attest. Um, since I've been with the coalition, we have given testimony uh, upwards of 350 public comments. And, and so uh, just really keeping a steady drumbeat there. We have put out sign-on letters. We do a lot of public education through tabling, creating resources, putting on webinars, workshops, uh, trainings, and doing a lot of work through social media. Um, we provide action, actionable items, action alerts that folks can easily uh, and quickly complete to engage on this work. Uh, we work hard to keep Fossil Free Eugene in the media um, and so folks can learn about what we're up to. We do public actions, climate uh, marches and rallies and we work with subject matter experts. Again, leveraging the expertise of folks who you know, can really get into the weeds on specific issues is so critical um, as we do this grassroots work. And I don't think I really need to talk about Northwest Natural Tactics. I think we covered that really well in the other presentations. But what I really just wanted to highlight on this slide is just the incredible amount of money that Northwest Natural pumps into their campaign and which you know the gas industry at large has pumped into uh, countering electrification despite the inevitability of this transition. So I wanted to go over a really brief campaign timeline to kind of bring this together and show you where we started and how we got to where we are. So Fossil Free Eugene formed in November of 2020 um, to, to encourage a just transition off of fossil fuels. Um, one of the main reasons why the, the coalition came together was to, because Northwest Natural's franchise agreement was up for renewal. and this franchise agreement would have locked Eugene into, I believe, 20 more years or so of um, a, a contract with this gas utility and just, uh, you know, increasingly building out that fossil fuel infrastructure, which we were hoping not to, to need. So happily, the Eugene City Council voted not to renew that agreement February 2021. November 2021, Eugene passed motions to make it the first uh, Oregon city to advance an electrification mandate for new buildings. Um, in August of 2022, there was a letter submitted to the Department of Justice asking for investigations of Northwest Natural's false and misleading ads focused on climate. Um, this one is kind of an outlier. September 2022, city councilor Claire Surratt was recalled. I just put this on here because I wanted to highlight you know how much it can it can shift a campaign depending on who your elected leaders are and when you lose a champion it, it can really shift the dynamic so that that you know created some setbacks in our campaign um, in November 2022 
Um, so Northwest Natural had proposed a hydrogen blending project in surprise, surprise, um, you know, an environmental justice neighborhood in Eugene, and happily that was canceled due to public pressure and a petition to the PUC, um, I believe the Sierra Club, uh, Beyond Toxics, the NAACP were all part of that petition. Uh, another awesome victory is February 2023, Eugene became the first city in Oregon to pass an ordinance prohibiting new gas in residential construction. And then we see things really starting to ramp up here. Uh, Northwest Natural funded a ballot referendum campaign in March 2023. They gathered the required signatures after spending a million dollars in about two months, which is pretty significant. Um, then in April 2023, the Ninth Circuit Court did strike down the Berkeley's landmark electrification ordinance, as Jan mentioned. And then in July 2023, the Eugene City Council, in response, withdrew its electrification ordinance with the support of our coalition because of the, the legal uncertainty that that Berkeley Court uh, case cast over our ordinance. Um, and then that brings us to December 2023. Um, Danny mentioned we submitted another letter to the Department of Justice about the false and misleading health information that was being put out by Northwest Natural. And so you can see it's been a really up and down campaign. Uh, there has been a lot of amazing wins and a lot of setbacks due to, as I said, the, the incredible amount of money that Northwest Natural has put into countering our specific campaign. Um, but we are keeping, we're moving forward. There is a city council meeting scheduled in June to discuss uh, the new buildings issue. Again, we're really trying to focus on the envir environmental justice aspects of our campaign, and we are excited to keep moving forward. So another really central part of our platform, or of our goals, is to try and you know move the entire electrification movement forward in Oregon. And I, I feel really happy and confident saying that I think we have blazed a trail that others are following. And it is really fantastic to see other cities in Eugene um, finding their own, uh, you know, own pathways to electrification. Um, shouting out Mil Milwaukee, Ashland, Oregon is making some serious headway in their efforts to electrify. And this movement is completely youth led, which is incredible. Um, Talent, Oregon, is making some headway. Bend is another great city to highlight. Uh, they are, you know, a city that's very quickly growing. So putting in um, putting in uh, limits on on ga gas in new construction would be huge in a city like Bend. Corvallis has a strong electrification movement, and this continues to grow. And this is really, you know, what we want to see in in the work that we do no matter the setbacks that, that we are moving forward as a state and as a country in this in this effort so don't need to spend much time here i just wanted to uh you know invite folks to get engaged with fossil free eugene there's a lot of ways that you can do that and if you are not from eugene i encourage you to look and see if you have you know an electrification campaign in your community uh if you don't build your own coalition. I really encourage everyone to reach out to me for the slides, but also, you know, just to uh, talk about how we can, we can um, engage on this work, I organize, uh, educate, and let's kick some gas together. <laughs> All right, folks, let's open the floor to questions right there in the back. I have a question about the uh, referendum that Northwest Natural funded. So whoever, whoever knows, was Northwest Natural directly pumping money in, you know, through Northwest Natural to whoever the petitioners were, or were they donating a little small amounts to disguise it? <laughs> Is this an area where campaign finance reform might help in the future? Um, I don't know about the second question. I mean, maybe. Um, it depends. Uh, but the first question, yeah, absolutely. So once the ordinance was passed, I think on February 6th, two or three days later, um, two entities were registered with the Oregon Secretary of State, a petition committee, which is a committee that exists specifically to fund signature gathering, and then a PAC, which is a more general committee for, for campaigns. Um, they were registered by, he runs hundreds of PACs, but this guy at CNE Systems called Jeff Green, who Northwest Natural also works with. Um, the only named people associated with it was a PR professional in Eugene called uh, Anne Marie Levis of, of Funk Levis, who then, you know, later record showed was receiving tens of thousands of dollars. Um, 
was going from this campaign to Fun Clevis essentially to run the campaign. And we think they were probably running the campaign because we saw those people involved, like employees of Fun Clevis, wearing like Eugene for Energy Choice branded stuff, you know, before, while the ordinance was still being debated by council. You know, we were all these people show up to public hearings. Anyway, to, to sort of cut to it, yeah, I mean, a, a day or two after everything was, was funded, they started putting, from Northwest Natural Gas Company, you can look up the, the records, hundreds of thousands of dollars in, and they funded like 99.98% of those packs, you know, to these days. There's been a few other um, anonymous donations of $100 or less, but if it's over $100, you need to record it, and yet Northwest Natural has pretended that it's an independent thing, even though they are in the domain name, they've, you know, run the website. The website had the same, like, layout originally as a Northwest Natural Public Affairs website, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a pretty blatant, you know, um, orchestration of, of, a, of a faux grassroots campaign. And they were registered in Portland. Yeah, they were registered in Portland, that was the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to give a shout out to uh, Breach Collective, Danny and Nick Caleb were absolutely relentless in uncovering and publicizing this information and really changed yeah. the trajectory of the public debate around well, this. One thing I wanted to add very quickly is, is also we're starting to see with the more sort of contentious advertising and stuff from Northwest Natural that they're putting this disclaimer not paid for by Northwest Natural customers, which I think is an attempt to sort of evade, you know, PUC scrutiny for who they're billing this to and, you know, they could be billing it to their shareholder equity or their debt equity or another dimension of their business, but like they are 90% plus, 90% 90 90 plus of their revenue comes from being a utility, so. Okay, we have quite a few hands here. Um, start with Barbara and the Well, one major climate villain, villain in the Northwest you didn't mention is Puget Sound Energy, mm -hmm. which interestingly does gas and electricity. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is they were the spearhead of getting this whole coalition of gas companies mm -hmm. um, together. Uh, but the other thing that is interesting to me is uh, that UTC in Washington seems like their whole mission statement and everything sounds so much more positive than PUC in, Fort in Oregon. However, my understanding is that they're totally captured by PSC. Yeah, I mean, so I think I would just keep, I thought that was interesting. I was curious how it was actually playing out on the ground in the Washington UTC. It'd be a Wasn't question. there a settlement with PSC? that they're not allowed to do certain types yeah, of advertising no, it's, anymore? It's, it's so interesting. Like PSC, yes, is a climate villain, and it's sort of the best of the lot at the same time. They're so much better than Northwest Naturals and, and Cascade. So right now, that the phone that rang in the middle of the presentation rudely was a state legislator in Washington. We are so close to negotiating a gas decar bill in Washington that only applies to PSC. Uh, it's, you know, it's a step in the right direction, and it, it's it's a planning bill, but um, yeah, PSC is awful, and they're better than everyone else. Great, <laughs> <laughs> um, right, we have. Oh gosh, okay. The, I think the quickest hand was the sparkly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is for Young. Um, I on your map you had Colorado and shaded relief um, of the states that had not yet, and I'm assuming that's because of the ballot measure that we have. Um, Colorado uh, energy um, companies are running about measure to ban this, um, this, um, the types of statutes that you're talking Local about. Regulation. Do you, is that not why you shaded it? You're kind of shaking your head. I, I didn't make the map. I just pulled it off of a website, so I don't know anything about okay. Colorado. But yeah. tell, us, tell us more, because I mean, these, these political fights are super difficult. They're extremely well funded by the fossil fuel industry. Yeah, there's a ballot measure in Colorado um, that they, it looks like the energy companies will be moving forward with to ban this type of um, um, regulation, uh, which would put us um, not in line with the Pacific Northwest, it seems like. Um, and I, I guess I'm just curious because I, I don't know how, what kind of chance it has of passing, um, and I don't know um, like how detrimental that would be to our overall climate efforts in Colorado. So I was just hoping yeah. to learn a little bit more about that. So, I mean, when, when the Eugene fight, you know, we were going to run this fight in Eugene, and uh, Northwest Naturals was going to spend $4 million in Eugene on this question. So you can only imagine the amount of money that the industry would be prepared to spend statewide. Uh, I, uh, Dylan Plummer from Sierra Club was here. He would be a great uh, one to answer this question. You just, you need millions of dollars to win these public campaigns, and where's it going to come from, you know? Uh, th and they, they, they fight dirty. 
uh, they they say we you know we want to take away your gas stove like the the public um, polling on these is not great for us like the stove thing has become a little bit of a culture war signifier mm -hmm. and and you know people don't people don't care about the energy that heats their hot water but they care about how they cook their food that kind of runs deep so it's 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 scary uh, it's hard it's it's hard to win. Um, Well, Eugene started to. <laughs> um, I'd be interested to talk more yeah, because talk more. I've been track, tracking what's happening with gas regulation in Colorado because it, it has historically been better than Oregon. Um, if you're clean heat, you have a clean heat program. So anyway, maybe we can talk after. Yeah. Um, Joan? I've been simmering for years on the idea about measuring um, the pollution not in dollars but in climate clean air, clean water, and I wonder if some of this underlying campaign would grab more people by talking about economy in the economy of clean air, water, future, that kind of thing. I'm not sure how to do this, but it feels like a timely place to reach out. Jack is a comment. Mm -hmm. Jack. Thanks, Jenny. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? We've got a couple minutes. Um, in the back and not the um, center? Question about the map of the proposed natural gas pipeline. Is the major purpose of that delivering na more natural gas to the Pacific Northwest, or is it part of the concerted effort of bringing natural gas and selling it to the Asian market? Well, that's the, that's a big question. Like, where is all this gas going? Um, you know, to to fill the context, there are you know export terminals that have been proposed on the West Coast uh, here in Oregon. You beat the big terminal. Uh, for Coos Bay, that was a huge victory for this movement. There are terminals in, in BC. Um, so uh, is the idea to put it on boats and ship it off or, or to use it? The weird thing is that uh, the company was able to produce precedent agreements with utilities here, in, in including Cascade Gas and a, a utility in Oregon, that said, yeah, we're willing to sign a 30-year agreement for, for this increased gas. And it's just... It's nuts. Like, how can Cascade Gas, especially, which is under, you know, effectively a statutory mandate to phase out um, greenhouse gas emissions, how can it be signing a 30-year um, contract to buy more gas? And, and that's going to be the key question in front of FERC. Like, do they have to dig deeper than this piece of paper uh, that, that they relied on? And there's a lot of question about um, Amazon and its data centers out in Eastern Oregon. That was one potential, that was sort of our, our flag um, because they had fossil fuel cells that they were going to be relying on because they don't have enough electricity. Um, the transmission is constrained um, to them. So, so that was the question, is whether Cascade is going to sell to Amazon or not. I think we have time for maybe one more question, and I will say, I think we'll we could around. probably stick yeah, around yeah. and keep, keep chatting about this. Um, I'm looking for, I think I saw an early hand over here that disappeared. Can I? Can yeah, um, I feel like this claim for utility companies in like the Midwest is that with like peak demand, when it's really hot or really cold, it's not the most dangerous, the natural gas is still necessary in most states. Do you think that's a source of misinformation? Yeah, um, Northwest Natural is actually engaged in that same rhetoric out here, even though you know they they've constructed a very misleading study focusing on like peak demand during an ice storm, not the most recent one, but a, a ice storm we had in late 2022. Um, I mean, we actually do, despite the weather today, have a pretty mild climate here, mm -hmm. and the evidence that's been done, I think, by RMI and the Sierra Club shows that like you can be comfortable on an all-electric system and it'll actually reduce if we particularly like you know, yeah i asked how many people had a, a heat pump like i have electric resistance heating and have had electric resistance heating i think in every home i've had in eugene if we can retrofit that with higher efficiency heat pumps sometimes you know three or four times more efficient that's going to reduce demand and, and leave people just as comfortable so yeah, there are solutions. The Midwest poses, I think, some slightly different challenges, but it does not actually, it doesn't obviate the case to transition as much 
in as many buildings as possible. But I'll just time. say that, oh yeah, Caleb, go ahead. Well, I, I would add too, there's been lots of recent examples of the gas system failing during extreme mm -hmm. cold recently. Yeah. And so um, you even here, just this winter, Jackson Prairie, the gas storage facility of Washington State went down and there was like really an emergency for about six hours there. And so the idea that somehow it's the most resilient fuel is not really holding up to reality. We have problems with both sides, right? Like our gas utility have major problems, but our electric utilities do too, right? And so the fact that people were without electricity in Portland during the most recent ice storm, my parents lived with me for six days, <laughs> right? Like because their electricity went out and then their pipes broke. Um, and, and so that that's a problem, right? Um, and, and so we need to be holding our electric utilities equally accountable yeah. to assist in, in this transition so that people have reliable electricity when they need it. Yeah, and in you, Jane, the, the question really is who is more accountable? Wall Street traded, investor owned, BlackRock owned, Northwest Natural, or the Eugene Water Electricity Board that is democratically collect, el elected and I have the phone number of, of one of the commissioners and <laughs> can, get, can get a beer with him anytime. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. I can connect you with any one of the panelists or just send you the slides, so please do reach out. Oh.